uh, welcome everyone to the uh, session by Constantine uh, von uh, Schmidt Poly. Uh, so the session is titled as Customer Obsession. So just to have a quick introduction, so Constantine has over 30 years of combined experience as a program leader and agile transformation coach. He has helped transition uh, various uh, US federal agencies, nonprofit organizations, and the Fortune 100 enterprises from the existing work practices to the agile understanding. So that connects all the layers of the organization to the new lean and agile self-sustaining ways of working. So without further delay, uh, I'll give it to you, Constantine. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. I, I really appreciate it. So uh, good evening, everyone. Good morning uh, or anything in between where, wherever you might be located. So um, I'm, I'm excited to be able to present on a topic that's very near and dear to me because at the end of the day, when we talk about agility, really it has to involve everyone in the organization. And I think when we look at... Um, one enterprise that clearly has embraced um, obsessively focusing on the customer. We know that this is arguably Amazon. They have in many ways become the blueprint of how we actually engage feverishly with our customer, making sure that we are doing everything for the customer and everything that we're not doing should is waste. So really um, kind of they have set the blueprint. A lot of organizations try to model them. Really, it requires a discipline, and what I want to kind of walk through today is, uh, you know, some of the things that uh, we as an organization can do to to connect. But why is there a disconnect with customers? So these are some of the things that I, in my practice, have found. Uh, and really, I'm not going to read all the bullets on the slide, but it's really it sums up in, in in kind of a couple of sentences that a lot of organizations still, if you look at the customer being on the left, a lot of organizations are still traveling out to the right. So they're having large projects. They're, they're happy about you know, quality of the projects, but the outcomes come very late and they're not necessarily lined up with what was initially requested. We build long requirements documents, but ne not necessarily written to this, what the customer actually wanted. And also very important is that a lot of organizations don't leverage the, the discipline of user experience, which is really uh, a, 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 an investment that is very, very valuable to have because really that connects you with the customer and there are experts in that field that can help with that. So let's take a look kind of as at the, at the life cycle, if you will, of you know, customer obsession and the touch points and the disciplines that we have associated with that. So clearly on the top, you know, what Mensch just mentioned it, user experience, being able to connect, understand, sense what the customer needs, and then tying that to a lean delivery model. So what's valuable today may not be valuable six months down the road. So we have to connect and really resonate with the customer very quickly. But then once we have a solution in, uh, introduced to the customer, then really the road starts because then you have the digital experience. You need to make sure that you have your customers be able to work with you in the way that they want to. So a digital experience that's useful, fast, easy, simple, that they are uh, it's actionable and that they really have can, can get because oftentimes, you know, you may have a pr product that still has some issues, but you, if you have great customer service, then that will make up for it and vice versa. And then uh, to the, 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 the top circle there, um, as we loop back, uh, the customer experience, that's kind of the goodwill, the citizen engagement, the, the brand that you're building. So this is all kind of one circular loop. But we are going to focus on really tying user experience to a lean operating model. I want to spend a little bit of time on the discipline of UX, human-centered design. So this is really where it starts. Again, the customer is on the left and we purposefully uh, do research. We try to empathize. What are some of the problem areas that we're trying to address? We then help, uh, coming out of that step, define by compiling the research, what we've observed and really pinning down kind of those air problem areas which we then go into kind of design thinking. We ideate on some solutions and we bring that into kind of a prototype form and we loop it back to the customer through some form of rapid iterative testing and evaluation. And then we launch, which would be hopefully a short, short cycle, minimal marketable feature in which we gather, gather feedback. And we use uh, some of the methodologies that you see on the screen as well. Key thing is you know, design thinking, experience design, because you really want to connect with your customer in that respect. So really what we're looking at at a high level is that we need to travel from the problem to the solution space. 
And we need to have that interactive feedback loop with the customer. All the while, sometimes customers have pie in the sky ideas and say, you know what? We really love this. You may build it for us. Uh, well, it may not necessarily be aligned with the architectural runway. There may be solution architecture that is not in pace with that. So you want to make sure that you are in, in lockstep with you know, your solution architects, the technical advisors that can kind of validate that along the way. So that's very important. Pulling the onion back a little more because I kind of wanted to make sure that there are kind of two artifacts or two processes to share with you here. User journeys. If we don't do user journeys, if we don't interact with our customers, how do we know? So we need to put ourselves in, in that space and say, well, let's walk through the scenarios. What are your goals? What are the challenges, the touch points? And then figure out the persona. You know, how do we make that persona get what they need? And ultimately, here you have um, the, the other thing is which, where you have empathy maps. And uh, the empathy maps are basically let you think, feel, and hear, and see how you interact with your customer and what your customer really needs. So that's kind of the user experience side, kind of to the left, right? Um, now let's uh, focus on, for a moment here, on how we visualize what we've learned from user experience uh, to actually define it how we build out the product roadmap. So this is basically uh, uh, Karen Martin and Martin Osterling um, have been authorities in kind of lean design thinking. Um, they wrote a book back in 2013. And I like what they say is if you can't describe what you're doing as a value stream, you don't know what you're doing. And so that resonates, I think, with a lot of organizations. What value streams maps really are is that you are basically defining every step that it takes to deliver value to the customer. And it looks at the people that support these steps and it looks like the systems that are supported by it. So wouldn't that be wonderful if you at some point could say, oh, I can eliminate two steps in this process and make it more efficient for my customer to, to get my products. That, that will help you illuminate where are their areas. And then if you exercise value stream mapping on the road, you are actually able to build a, a situation where you can uh, hone in on problem areas where there's waste, where you look at cycle time, you can look at lead time. So again, that combined with what you learn from the customer and now you're visualizing your product roadmap, very, very powerful. So who are the benefactors, right? So the customer again in the middle. As an agile team, if I can see the chevrons that I'm trying to improve in the process flow by reducing lead time or cycle time, I can clearly hone in on and say, here are the things, the, the things that we are going to focus on in terms of our development efforts. Quality operations, your regression testing or your root cause analysis will be easier to see because you're looking at problem areas at a particular process step. You don't have to go all the way back necessarily where it's not relevant. So you have that visibility. And clearly user experience, you can better align on areas to optimize. And then the product management has the visualization of the overall product roadmap life cycle value stream, so they can make some strategic decisions to make it more efficient down the road. So I know I'm jumping very quickly here uh, around a lot of concepts, but there's a discipline that needs to happen to bring this all together. So let me kind of, uh, kind of bring it all together in an initial, and don't worry, you don't have to read this on a very small screen. I'm going to be showing you some, some highlights uh, on steps across the way. So first, let's just take a look at this map here, right? So you have, everything starts with the customer at the left. All great ideas are welcome. We um, then take it all the way through this whole process of analysis, UX, and ultimately feedback loops through uh, MVPs. But now let's talk take a look at this in a little more detail. The first one is, it's, you need to kind of create a space for your customer to say, we're, okay, we welcome all great ideas. Depending if you're B2C or B2B, you might have different artifacts. In this example, you have a lean business canvas that someone representing the customer could fill out, the customer could do it himself or herself, or you simply have a feedback and insights form where you gather you know, great ideas that come in. And then you as a product management team are really looking at, this is the voice of the customer that's coming in, right? This isn't kind of just the surrogate, uh, which uh, we at the enterprise think we are, we are assuming. So then the second step is you go through analyzing. And the analyzing really is taking the initial input and bringing it uh, into a 
uh, a, a format where you can gather a little more information. But the idea is that you remove yourself from creating large tomes of business requirements documents. You have a single lean feature canvas where you identify the problem statement. You look at the things that you have on the screen here, you fill those out. And by the way, that also sets the stage for some formulas on prioritization, which we're gonna to go to in a little while. So that this could be something that's sliced up small enough for the team to understand and build in a very short life cycle versus aligned with a big project plan that uh, again, will take things down a path that we don't want to be. We want to more be more feature oriented, not project oriented. And also we're validating is what we're being proposed, what proposed here, is it aligned with a value stream that we've established? Is, and if it's not, still a good idea, but it might not be one that you want to maybe prioritize as a high priority, or you would align it with another part of the organization. So the third step is, again, we, we looked at it in on a previous slide, is there's a whole area of lean UX where we take this process of uh, human-centered design, but we do it in a more compressed format. We don't eliminate the steps, but we cycle through it quicker so that we can get through this diverge, converge um, approach and ultimately come up with something that will then culminate um, where you then can say, okay, now I have some initial analysis. Now let me uh, take a look. Uh, we can't do everything at once, right? It's impossible. So we need to basically prioritize. These are a couple of prioritization models that you can look at. Um, organizations will use different ones. There are probably some, some additional ones also, but these are some of the main ones that organizations will use. Okay, so of these features, we're going to basically use this formula. We're going to prioritize them based on that weighting. Now we're going to get into kind of the implementing part of the story. So one thing that we experience that actually helps is before you do any kind of big room planning or alignment when you have multiple teams dependent on each other, is for the product owner, the product management, um, any the representation from UX to say, okay, we're going to now um, do a story mapping exercise. We'll take the feature that we prioritize, we're going to present it to you, and now you can basically take it through the process of sequencing and prioritizing, and then you can ring fence what might be viable to release with, uh, within a release of you know, a couple of sprints, for example. And then you go into big room planning. So ultimately, the big room planning part is where you bring all the teams together to then create your MVP backlog. And then what we like to also often see is that you, can, you want to make sure that you're 100% aligned with your customer in terms of any visual design. So making sure that you're interpreting this correctly. So you can do this in terms of uh, conducting a sprint zero, where you uh, essentially are going through the, the cycle of doing more tendencies and you have the front running of UI designers that would create artifacts might have developers that set up their environments, but ultimately then you align on what's needed uh, within that kind of startup sprint to get to a kind of a definition of ready. So you work very closely so that when you start development, you're not scrambling to say, what, what did the customer interpret for us? So, and then once we've done that, we actually execute the MVP. So we're getting now to the point where you are executing the MVP and there are some critical decisions you need to make. After working through designing the right thing, have we done it right? And so you need to validate whether or not you've met the business hypothesis, or if you basically need to revisit that and take it back through a development cycle, or you basically need to pivot, or you persevere because say, yes, we're online, or in worst case scenario, you stop while you're not investing too much. So that's kind of a decision points that are quite critical. And then, Ultimately, you are going to look at adopting because what you do in terms of when you actually map up whether or not the deliverable meets what the requirements were, or the acceptance criteria, at that, that point, you don't know yes, necessarily yet how well you interact um, with how, the, how well the customer is perceiving that product. So you need to have some adoption metrics and you need to also say how fast uh, do we deliver, right? With what quality? So if you see here, for example, we have the product value stream. We also have the process value stream. So we can say, how long is it taking us to go through the cycle? How long is it really, you know, are we, are we, do we need to accelerate in certain things? So what you see here uh, on this screen is kind of more of a kind of sequential view. But many of my, some, some of you may have seen this model here uh, before, 
where uh, this is basically an iterative lean startup model to kind of visualize that everything that we talked about is iterative. It's not sequential. It goes through a cycle, essentially showing what um, I shared with you on some of those process steps. But it takes it through the abstract, figuring out you know, what do we need to evaluate, analyze, and making it concrete in terms of getting the solution from problem to actually something valid that the customer can, 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 uh, can accept and it resonates with. So last uh, but not least, I wanted to kind of share in summary, what kind of what are some of the behavior changes that we need to do in terms of being more in tune with our customer as you've kind of seen kind of the process that we walked through. Clearly, obviously you need to be customer centric but at every level of the organization. And we don't want to be kind of project to project, transactional oriented. We want to become more product focused and we want to basically be able to it, and deliver and measure what adds real value, just not outputs, right? Um, sense, be multi-sensory, uh, think like the customer, feel like the customer. And again, I mentioned it earlier, adapt a lean UX discipline. Uh, it'll pay dividends. And then ultimately what we talked about, you know, you visualize your product life cycle. And if you do all these things, you can actually successfully build a lean product operating model that will tie the whole organization to what the customer is asking for. So that, I um, wanted to thank you all very much. Um, I know we're just about at time here, but I uh, welcome um, any questions that you might have. And uh, I thank you very much for, 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 for listening here. Great session. Uh, thank you, Constantine. And uh, I believe, you know, uh, uh, anybody, if uh, you have any questions, if you want to, you know, put in. Uh, now we have a few more minutes where Constantine can take some questions. So I believe there's one question which has come from Gitanjali, which says, uh, "Can you say Jira is the tool that combines lean and agile part well for implementation?" Oh, absolutely! A uh, great, great question. Jira. Well, we all know Jira has its its positives and some negatives. But yes, uh, taking your JIRA construct and not just aligning it with your development, but bringing a JIRA board at the program level, you can create a program Kanban and you can tie those together. And you have the traceability because keep in mind, you wanna trace your feature implementation all the way through development. So you wanna have that trace back. So JIRA, if you're thinking about that, absolutely a great tool that you would wanna use. Okay, there's one more question from um, Ankit Agarwal. Uh, which says, uh, what is the top thing customer appreciate with the approach you have mentioned? The top thing that they appreciate is that they basically are uh, seeing that the companies resonate, it, uh, it resonates with what their needs are, right? So if you are able to identify the need and then very quickly come back with them to them with maybe not even a complete solution, but a partial solution that does what intended well, then the customer will have the confidence that uh, you are working with them and that you're not having them wait for uh, long project cycles to deliver something of value. So really, if, you, if there's one thing you kind of want to highlight is this reducing the time to market and reducing the cost of delay. Because if you delay something that's delivered to the customer, they may be lapped by the competition. So they need to have something quick. And so if you can do build uh, unambiguous and fast, you, you you are going to be very much in the trust situation with the customer. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I hope, Ankit, that answers your question. We have uh, one more question from Preeti Munod, uh, which says, uh, for the to do customer-centric development, do we need to follow BDD practice agile development? That's a great question. Uh, that was a whole, I wanted to actually see if, to build some slides into it, but we could have, we would have been, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes into the presentation. BDD, absolutely. Taking behavioral driven development, aligning it with that is the logical extension, right? Having a well-established pipeline, having the kind of three amigo concept where you are lockstep with the PO, uh, taking what exactly the customer's envisioning and cycling it through to left shift that whole process, the test first, it is, it is uh, perfect in terms of alignment with this because in BDD practice, you're ultimately then getting out of the estimation game because you're bringing things down to a very small unit of work, which is, resides in a feature file. 
and you're executing. So your throughput is consistent and you're bringing it back. So BDD practice harmonizes really well in, in, this, in this customer-centric model. Great, great, great. Thank you. Uh, uh, I believe uh, that answers your question, Preeti. Please uh, feel free to you know, put in any comments if you have uh, in the comments section. Uh, uh, there's there's one I think we'll take one more question and uh, we can you know for the rest of the questions we can you know uh, feel free to have them in the hangout section. So there's one question from Srinivasan Sundaram. Uh, he asks, what are the challenges you faced while transforming from project mindset to product centric mindset? Really good question. It's it, it's not easy because you think about it the role of a project. Uh, is guided by a project manager and they are more kind of more attuned to kind of command and control or more prescriptive to say, you know, this is, well, I know this is how we need to do things versus being adaptive and taking a, more of the backseat and allowing self-empowered teams to, to flourish. It becomes really, it's, it's, it's an organizational change element as well. So when we have this engagement, there's usually an OCM component, component as well, where we're literally looking at the new job families and what the, how these job families are different coaching the existing project managers, for example, on being a more adaptive and aligning that with the team. So there's a lot of, if you will, there's some, some 101s and then there's more kind of meet the teams where they are. Each team, each engagement is different, but it is absolutely, uh, depending on the level of maturity and agile maturity, we'll like to do kind of a, a, a baseline assessment. We'll let them, you know, the team self-assess. And then we as coaches do kind of we validate, okay, show me some of the artifacts that support your assessment. And then we'll do our assessment and then kind of take them on the journey and at some point then reassess how far they've come. And it doesn't only trans transcends into other areas. Product owner roles may not be visible, maybe just a business owner. or So we need to basically go and, 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 and build this from the ground up and in both directions, from the, from the handshake, from what we bring in from the customer and then ultimately how it gets delivered. Cool, cool, great. Uh, thank you. I think uh, Srinivas and I hope that answers your question. We have three more questions, but uh, uh, there's one question from Ganesh, and, uh, Ganesh, mm -hmm. which has come on the chat. Um, but uh, so I'll read that for you. Uh, but maybe if, uh, uh, if there's a uh, if there's a long answer to it, maybe we can take it in the hangout session. But regardless, I'll read that question out to you. So he has asked, are there any real time case studies that we can have to understand this? That's a great question. So um, certainly at EPAM, we do have case studies, but we we have to be a little mind, mindful about how we share those, right? But yeah, we have we have uh, materials. We clearly have um, sometimes anonymized ones that we've done. Yes, but we mm -hmm. across our engagements, we always uh, end an engagement with with case studies that we'd like to like to um, put in place. Yeah, so, so so case case study exists, but there's a, a policy around being able to share those. Unfortunately, cool. Um... Uh, I believe there are two more questions and both are from Gitanjali. Uh, I'll take the top one and uh, Gitanjali, I think the next question, uh, please feel free to, you know, interact with Constantine on the uh, Hangout. So I'll take the last question and then okay. you know, we can move. So uh, the, uh, there's another one which Gitanjali asks is, account, according to you, which agile job roles should primarily involve with stakeholder, uh, with stakeholder with respect to requirement understanding documenting before team onboards from sprint zero. Okay, so basically you want to make sure that you're aligned um, all the way at the left with a product management culture. So product management will basically establish the roadmap in close alignment with the, the, the customer, will establish the value stream. And then ultimately uh, that's the strategy uh, the longer term strategy, then that at, at, at periodic levels where you're focusing in on areas of the value stream that you want to focus on to create efficiency, that then drops to the PO level, the product owner, which is more of a tactical alignment with the teams. So the product manager will say, we have to prioritize these sets of things because we want to improve a particular Chevron on the value stream, for example. So the product owner will then take uh, those requirements, which again, are typically kind of a more in a lean uh, feature canvas. So there may be four or five or six of those uh, that have been prioritized. And then ultimately they take those to the team in a big, big room planning, or even before the big room planning, they to kind of do, do some decomposition of stories uh, in through story mapping, and then finally bringing it to a uh, kind of an efficient starting point for big room planning to say, okay, now we've already broken down the stories to the level that we can do some estimation. 
Now let's align on our, our dependencies. So it, it, but the whole aspect is you're not, the product owner's not bringing a business requirements document with 500 pages to the team. It's all been kind of validated on, on, a, on a very lean, uh, lean um, you, know, you know, definition in terms of what the user needs that can be implemented within a reasonable time frame of a couple of sprints to get that feedback loop. Cool. Um, I, I think, you know, we've had a good number of questions and we are almost uh, eight minutes uh, ahead of uh, uh, our, our scheduled time. But I'm, I'm glad there are so many questions that are coming in. And I would like to thank Constantine for this, uh, for sharing your great experience uh, uh, and guidelines with us today. Mm -hmm.